Hello, everyone, and welcome to lecture 27 of Computer Architecture. Today, we're going to talk about two things. Uh, first, we're going to talk about stalling and how to stall the pipeline. And then we're going to talk about uh, control hazards uh, and how we deal with control hazards. OK, uh, so let's get Last time we spoke about forwarding, we saw how to handle forwarding in the pipeline. Uh, and we saw that uh, when we have uh, dependencies in our code, so for example, we have a subtract instruction that writes to register two, and then we have it's followed by this and and the or instruction that read from register two, also these add and store instruction also read from register two. Uh, we saw that uh, for the and and the or instruction, uh, the, re the write to the register file takes place after uh, the cycle on cycle five, whereas the and and the or instruction want to read register from the register file on cycle two and cycle three. So obviously, uh, we ca this cannot happen, right? We cannot read register from the register file before it is written on cycle five. So the way we dealt with this is by forwarding. Uh, so in the case of the and instruction, we forward it from the beginning of the execute stage, the beginning of the so it's the beginning of the data memory stage of sub to the beginning of the execute stage for and. Uh, and for the or instruction, we forwarded from the beginning of the, the, the write back stage for sub to the beginning of the execute stage for or. OK, uh, whereas in these other cases with add and store word, these instructions were su sufficiently far enough so that we can read, uh, write the register to, to the register file and then read it on the same cycle for add or read it on the next cycle for store. Uh, so what we wanted to do is we wanted to see how we can support forwarding from the beginning of the write back stage, to, sorry, beginning of the data memory stage to the beginning of the execute stage, or from the beginning of the write back stage to the beginning of the execute stage. Uh, what we did is we modified our data path to add these multiplexers uh, at the beginning of the execute stage that will either select the data coming from the instruction decode stage, or they will select the data forwarded from the beginning of the data memory stage, or they will select the data forwarded from the execute, from the write back stage. And the way that these multiplexers decide what to select is uh, by uh, signals coming from a forwarding unit. And this forwarding unit decides whether to forward or not to forward and from which stage to forward by comparing the source registers in the execute stage, RS and RT, to the destination registers in the right the right back stage and the data memory stage those are rd and of course by also checking if the instructions in the right back stage and the memory stage uh, actually write back and they do that by looking at the reg write signal so that was a quick review of what we covered last time any questions about this Okay, if there are no questions, uh, move on to today's topic, which is stalling uh, and control hazards. And let's start by talking about stalling. Uh, so if you remember, uh, with the, one of the places where we, where we had to stall in the pipeline data path that we built is whenever we have a load use data hazard. So a load use data hazard has when you have a load instruction, like this one, for example, that's writes to some register, for example, register, for example, register two, and then it's followed by an AND instruction or kind of any other instruction that reads from register two. So in this case, we have a hazard. And why is this different from uh, another data hazard where, th where this could be a kind of an, an AD instruction, for example? Well, the reason it's different is because when we have a load instruction, the value that we load is not available until after the data memory stage. So it's not available until over here in the pipeline. OK, so if this was an add instruction, the value would be available at the end of the execute stage and we could forward it to the beginning of the execute stage of the next instruction. So we would not have a problem. But because load instruction, the value is not available until the end of the data memory stage. And because of that, we cannot forward, right? Because the value is available uh, at, the, at the beginning of cycle five. Uh, but it is needed by the next instruction at the beginning of cycle four. Okay, and we can't forward back in time. Uh, 
so because we can't forward in this case, what uh, whenever we have a load use data hazard, a load followed immediately by an instruction that needs to use the loaded value, what we need to do in this case is we need to stall. It's inevitable to stall. So what does stalling look like here? Well, here what happens. What happens is when we get to cycle three, in cycle three, when we when we are decoding the AND instruction, we realize that we need to access register two, but we know that we've already seen the load instruction which writes to register two. So we know that in in cycle three, we know that we cannot let the AND instruction proceed to the execute stage because if it proceeds to the execute stage, it will not have the data it needs to execute. So what we need to do in this case is uh, uh, when we are in cycle three and we notice that the AND instruction is in, in instruction decode stage and cannot proceed to the execute stage in cycle four, we need to stall the AND instruction. So we're gonna let the load continue to cycle to data memory in cycle four. However, we need to stall the AND instruction to keep it in the instruction decode stage in cycle, in cycle four. And consequently, we're gonna have to stall the OR instruction as well and keep it in the instruction memory stage. So it looks like this. We're gonna stall the AND instruction. So the AND instruction was in the decode stage in cycle three. It's gonna stay in the decode stage in cycle four. And we're gonna replace, uh, and in between the AND instruction and the load instruction, we're gonna insert a bubble or a no-op. No-op is an operation that doesn't do anything, the bubble. Uh, and the OR instruction that was in the instruction memory stage in cycle three, we're also gonna stall that in the instruction, sorry, instruction fetch stage. We're also gonna stall that so that it stays in the instruction fetch stage in cycle four, okay? And by doing this, now that we, now that we stalled the AND instruction in, uh, in the ID stage for both cycle three and cycle four, when we get to cycle five and the AND instruction needs register two, now register two is available because now we've we've finished the data memory stage of the load instruction. So now we can forward the register two from the beginning of the right uh, the right back stage of the load instruction to the beginning of the execute stage of the AND instruction. Okay. So this is how we need to stall the pipeline whenever we have a load use data hazard. Uh, now this is, uh, I, I did this explanation using this multi-cycle pipeline diagram, but let me using the single cycle pipeline diagram because that, uh, that could make it easier to visualize. So here's the situation that we're in. We have a load instruction in the execute stage that, that writes to register two. We have an AND instruction in the instruction decode stage that reads from register two. And we have an OR instruction here that's being fetched. Okay, so we don't care about what is here. I'm giving it or as an example. We don't really care about what it is. What we care about is it's being fetched. Now, what happens in this case? Well, in this case, we know that if we let the AND instruction on the next cycle proceed to the execute stage, we will not be able to execute it because register two will not be available because it would because the load instruction would be in the data memory stage, which would still be loading register two. So what we have to do is we should not let the AND instruction proceed to the execute stage. We should let the load instruction proceed to the data memory stage, okay? But the AND instruction should stall and stay in the instruction decode stage. So what happens is that this load instruction is going to proceed to the data memory stage. We're gonna allow the load instruction to proceed to the memory stage. However, we're not going to let the OR and the AND instruction proceed. Instead, we're going to insert a NOOP in the execute stage. Okay. And we're going to stall the AND instruction in the instruction decode stage. And we will stall the OR instruction in the instruction fetch stage. So this is what we need to do. Now, the reason this works is because on the next instruction, what happens is that the load instruction will be in write back and the AND instruction will be an execute, and we can forward from the write back to the execute stage, okay? So in order to deal with this load use data hazard, we need to let the load instruction proceed, insert a no-op in the execute stage, and stall the OR and the AND instruction in the, uh, in the pipe, in the, in the instruction fetch instruction decode stage, okay? 
So now what I'm going to do is I'm going to explain what hardware structures we need to do. To need to, we need to add to do everything I described. But before that, is this clear? Is it clear how stalling works? Is it clear that we need to let the load instruction proceed, answer to no up and execute, and stall the end instruction and decode? Okay, good. Uh, so the question now is, how do we insert a no-op? How do we stall the instruction decode and, uh, and the instruction fetch instruction? Well, first of all, let's look at how to insert a no-op. So what we want to do is we want to uh, insert a no-op uh, in the execute stage. Well, what is a no-op? What does it mean for instruction to not do anything? Well, what it means for instruction to not do anything is that it should not read from memory, it should not write to memory, it should not write to any registers, and it should not branch or jump anywhere. Okay, in other words, for an instruction to not do anything, its mem write its control signal should be zero, its mem read control signal should be zero, its write, read, reg write control signal should be zero, its uh, branch control signal should be zero, its jump control signal should be zero. So all its control signals should be set to zero. If we set all the control signals to zero, then the instruction is not going to have any effect. So essentially, it's going to be a no -op. So how do we do that? Well, what we want to do is we want to be able to set all the control signals in the execute stage. To do this is uh, over here. So here we have the control signals coming from our control unit and going into our pipeline register. What we're going to do is we're going to add a multiplexer over here. And this multiplexer is either going to select the control signals coming from the control unit, or they're, they're going to select zero. So it's going to set all the control signals to zero. So if we would like to end no up in the execute stage on the next cycle, the way we do that is by simply config, configuring this multiplexer to select zero for all the control signals. Okay, so this is how we insert a. No op. Okay, so now we know how to insert a no op into the execute stage. What we still need to do is we need to uh, we need to stall the AND instruction in the instruction decode stage. Okay, how do we stall the AND instruction in the instruction decode stage? Well, simply what we need to do is we need to make sure that the the, the AND instruction is in thirty two bits over here. So to stall the AND instruction in the instruction decode stage, all we need to do is to make sure that these bits do not change. How can we make sure that the 32 bits that encode the instruction do not change? Reading these 32 bits from this uh, pipeline register over here, the instruction fetch, but I'm uh, first I'm talking about stalling the AND instruction, not the OR instruction. Okay, so we stall the OR instruction by not updating the PC. You're absolutely right. Uh, but I'm focusing now on the AND instruction. So how do I make sure the AND instruction stalls? It doesn't change. Well, I need to make sure that I do not update the IFID pipeline register. Okay, so I'm going to have a control signal IFID write that controls whether or not I write to the, this pipeline register. And if I want to stall the AND instruction, then what I need to do is I need to set IFID write to zero. And by doing that, what happens is we end up stalling the uh, instruction, the AND instruction in the instruction decode. State. Similarly, uh, because I'm stalling the AND instruction instruction decode stage, I don't want to lose the OR instruction, so I'm going to have to stall the OR instruction in the instruction fetch stage. And the way I stall the OR instruction in the instruction fetch stage is, like you guys said, we're going to set PC write to zero so that we do not update the PC on the next cycle. Okay, so we stall the OR instruction in the instruction fetch stage by disabling PC write. Okay, so in order to stall, these are the three things that we need to do. 
to insert a stall in between AND and load, these, there are three things we need to do. We need to set all our control signals to zero so that we have a no op go, go into execute in the next cycle. Uh, and we need to set our, uh, uh, disable our IFID right so that on the next cycle, uh, our, um, our AND instruction stays where it is. And we also disable PC right so that on the next cycle, our OR instruction stays where it is. Okay. Is this clear to everyone? Any questions about this? Okay, well, since we know this is what we need to do, we need to we have three control signals. Uh, the, the select signal for the multiplexer, IFID write and PC write. Okay, we these three control signals uh, are what allow me to all. Uh, so what we're going to need is we're going to need a hazard detection unit, right? Just like we had a forwarding unit in the execute stage, we're going to need a hazard detection unit in the instruction decode stage that is going to configure these three control signals to perform the stall when it detects a hazard. Okay. So what the hazard detection unit needs to do is it needs to detect if we have a load use data hazard. And if we have a load use data hazard, it's going to set the signals for the multiplexer, IFA write, and PC write according. Okay. Now, the how, how does the hazard detection unit determine that we have a load use data hazard? What information does the hazard detection unit need to know in order to determine that we have a load use data hazard? So remember, a load use data hazard happens when we have a load instruction in the execute stage that's writing to a register that's being used by some instruction in the instruction decode stage. Okay? So if we go to our hazard detection unit, how does what information does the hazard detection unit need to know in order to detect that we have a load use data hazard? Uh, if we have the same uh, register, the same register where and where? Right. So we need to check that we have a load instruction in the execute stage, and we need to check that the destination register of this load instruction is the same as the source registers of the instruction in the instruction decode stage. It's absolutely right. So what information do we need to make do all these checks? What information do we need from the instruction decode stage? Right, exactly. We need to know the source registers. We need to know RS and RT. So from the instruction decode stage, we're going to need to know RS and RT, and we get these from the instruction itself. So from the instruction, we extract the source registers of the instruction decode stage. So that's the first thing the hazard detection unit needs to know. What does the hazard detection unit need to know from the execute stage? OK, it needs to know the destination register, but before that, what, what does it need to know? Right, exactly. So I need to know if the instruction in the execute stage is a load instruction. Okay, how do I know if the instruction in the execute stage is a load instruction? Right, from the control signals. Which control signal in particular tells me that it's a load instruction? Well, the opcode is not available to us anymore in the in the execute stage. The opcode has already been decoded here. Right, exactly, mem read, exactly. So the mem read control signal tells us that the instruction in the execute stage is a load instruction. So we're going to use that to determine that the instruction in the execute stage is a load instruction. And if it's a load instruction, what do we need? What else do we need from the execute stage?
we need the destination register for the load instruction. What is the destination register for the load instruction? Is it R, is it RT or RD? No, it does not depend, right? This is a load instruction. So what format does the load instruction use? The I format, right? So does the I format have an RD field? It doesn't. The, the What is the destination register of a load instruction? It's always RT, right? It's always RT. So what we're going to do is we're going to take RT from here and we're going to bring it back and we're also going to feed that to the hazard detection unit. Okay? So to summarize, the hazard detection unit needs to know the source registers of the instruction and instruction decode stage. It needs to know the mem it needs the memory control signal from the execute stage to know if the instruction the execute stage is a load instruction. And it needs to know the destination uh, register of the load instruction in the execute stage, of course, if it's a load instruction. Okay? Is it clear? what the hazard detection unit needs to know. Uh, so don't worry about branches for now. We're focusing on load use data hazards now. But obviously, whenever we have branch, branch uh, hazards, we're going to need some kind of hazard detection as well. OK? But this hazard detection unit that we're talking about here is specifically for load use data hazards. Uh, okay, so given that this hazard detection unit now has all the information that it needs, the question remains, what is the condition for stalling? So under what condition will the hazard detection unit select zero here and disable IFID write and PC write? Under what condition? So what conditions need to hold? So what are our inputs? Our inputs are IDEX mem read and IDEX RT and IFID RS and RT. So what conditions need to hold? Well, first, I need to know that the instruction in the execute stage is a load is a load instruction. And I do that by checking IDEX.memread. Okay. So the first condition is IDEX.memread. And and what? What's the other condition? I need to have a load instruction to execute stage. And what? Right, we need to compare. So which registers do we compare? Right, so, so the other condition is that RT in the execute stage should be equal to RS or RT in the decode stage. So in other words, IDEX.RT is equal to IFID.RS or IDEX.RT is equal to IFID.RT. Okay, so RT in the execute stage is, should be equal to RS or RT in the instruction decode stage. So if this condition is true, then the hazard detection unit will determine that we have stall and it will disable PC write and IFID write. It'll set them to zero, and it will select zero for the in the, in the multiplex. Okay, is this clear to everyone? Any questions about stalling? So the purpose of stalling, again, is that we want to let the load instruction proceed while keeping the AND instruction in the instruction decode stage so that there are two stages in between them so that we, when, when the AND instruction proceeds to the execute stage, we can forward the value from the load instruction to the AND instruction. Okay? That's the purpose. That's why we're trying to do stalling. Because we cannot forward uh, the value of the load instruction to the to kind of the the immediate previous stage. Okay, great. Uh, so now we're done with talking about.
installing. Next, what we're going to do is we're going to talk about branch hazards. So if you remember, in the pipeline uh, that we um, in the pipeline that we uh, in the pipeline data path that we built, the branch outcome was determined uh, in the memory stage. The problem with determining the branch outcome in the memory stage uh, is that if we have a branch, we don't know the outcome of the branch until the end of the memory stage. And because of that, we're going to have to uh, we're uh, we're going to we're if we predict if we're using branch prediction, we're going to execute three instructions, and then by that time, uh, at the end of the memory stage, we know if we predicted correctly or not. So if we predicted incorrectly, what we're going to have to do is we're going to have to flush these three instructions that we executed. So we waste three cycles whenever we mispredict, uh, and then do the instruction fetch for the actual instruction that we need to execute. So remember what I told you is that when we when we um, uh, when we determine the branch outcome at the end of the memory stage, we waste a lot of cycles, and we want to avoid this. So previously, what I told you is our solution for that is to resolve the branch at the end of the ID stage instead of at the end of the memory stage. So in a previous lecture, I told you that we're going to do this, but I didn't tell you how we are going to do this. So what we're going to talk about today, our final topic for today, is how can we move the resolution of the branch instruction from the end of the memory stage to the end of the ID stage? That way, we don't have to waste three whole cycles whenever we have a misprediction. Okay, so let's see how to do that. Uh, is our pipeline data path. However, what I've done here is rather than doing, calculating the branch target. So here, remember how we took the offset, we multiplied it by four and we added it to PC plus four. This was doing PC relative addressing. So previously we were doing this in the execute stage. And the reason we're doing an execute stage is because we were using the ALU to compare the two registers, right? So we did not have the result of the equality comparison until the end of the execute stage. So we might as well just do the branch target resolution also in the execute. However, what we're going to do now to get the branch resolved at the end of the, at the instruction decode stage, is we're going to calculate the branch target in the ID stage. Okay, so we moved this adder and the shift left unit to the ID stage. And also what we're gonna do is we're gonna compare the two registers in the ID stage. So rather than using the ALU and using subtraction in the ALU to compare the two registers and check if they're equal, what we're gonna do is we're gonna add a functional unit, a logic block in the decode stage that only does comparison, okay? So compare, doing a comparison only is cheaper than doing a subtraction because you're just going to check if all the bits are equal. So that's an XOR operation. Okay. So what we'll do is we're going to add a comparator, which is much cheaper than ALU, at the end of the execute and the instruction decode stage. And this comparator is going to do the comparison for me. And that way we will know at the end of the instruction decode stage whether or not the two registers are equal. And if they are equal, what are the two? Uh, what are the two? What are these address that we need to branch to? Okay. So now in this case, I have this branch, and if I predicted that the branch is not taken, and I fetched the next instruction, which is the AND instruction. However, here at the end of the instruction decode stage, after I finish the branch resolution, I figure out that my prediction was incorrect. What is left for me to do is to kind of get rid of this AND instruction, and uh, which means we're going to lose uh, this instruction over here. We're going to lose a cycle. And on the next cycle, we're going to fetch the, uh, the instruction at the actual target of the branch that we calculated. OK, so to do that, what we need to do is we need a way. We're going to let the branch instruction, now the branch instruction is done, we're going to let it proceed to the next stage. But we don't want to let the AND instruction proceed to the next stage. We just want to insert a no up in the next stage. OK. And then we're going to fetch the actual instruction that we want in the, on the next step, instruction fetch stage. So to do that, to insert a no up in the instruction decode stage, what we will do is we will simply use 
uh, this control signal, the IF.flush control signal, to tell the IFID register to uh, just output zero. So when we output zero as an instruction, uh, that instruction will not do anything. Okay. So when we when we so we're going to resolve the branch in the instruction decode stage, and if we find that the branch should be taken, which means we should not execute the AND instruction, then what we will do is we will set IF flush to zero to to uh, we will set IF flush to uh, flush to the the pipeline register, and what that will do is that up the branch continues to the execute stage, but it's no longer going to do anything because because it's done, um, and then we insert a bubble in the instruction decode stage, okay? So this is the cycle that we make, this is the cycle that we lose because we mispredicted the branch, but it's better than losing three cycles. And then we fetch the load instruction, which was the target of the branch on the next cycle. So as you can see, the advantage of moving the branch resolution to the instruction decode stage is that we only have to stall one cycle. We only lose one cycle uh, when we mispredict the branch. But there's a we only waste one cycle on a misprediction. Okay. But there's a disadvantage, and the disadvantage is that so resolving branches at the end of the instruction decode stage stall it reduces the number of stalls for misprediction. So rather than stalling three, losing three cycles, we lost one cycle. However, the disadvantage is that we actually create data hazards for branches that were not there before. And what this does is that it results in stalls for a different reason, and that reason is when the branch uses data that was recently computed. Okay, so let me show you an example of why that's the case. So let's say uh, we have this example over here where we have an add instruction that writes to register one, and an add instruction that writes to register four. And then we have some instruction that does kind of, you know, something we don't care about. Uh, and then we have a branch instruction that reads register one and register. Okay. So now we are, we are reading register one and register four and we are using register one and register four in the instruction decode stage, not in the execute. Stage. So now when we want to forward, we actually need to forward to the instruction decode stage, not the execute. So register one here is going to be ready at the end of the execute stage. So by the time we get to the instruction decode stage of the branch, it's going to be available and we can forward it. And here the register four is going to be ready at the end of the execute stage for the add instruction, the second add instruction. So by the time we get to the instruction decode stage, this register is available and we can forward. Okay. So if we have uh, two or three instructions, so if, if the instruction uh, before the branch is two or three instructions away, we don't have a data hazard. We can forward from the right from the beginning of the write back or the beginning of the memory stage to the instruction decode stage. However, if the load instruction, so the branch instruction is preceded immediately by an instruction that produces the value that it needs. So for example, if the branch instruction is reading register four, and register four is written immediately on the previous cycle. Or if the branch instruction has a load instruction that is two cycles away from it, two, two instructions away from it. In both of these cases, we will have a data hazard. Why? The reason we have a data hazard is because now the branch is no longer read using uh, registers one and four in the execute stage. Okay, if it was using it in the execute stage, we don't have a problem. We can forward from the end of the memory stage of the load to the execute stage, and from the end of the memory, uh, 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 from the end of the execute stage of the add to the execute stage of the branch. So we were able to do this before. But now that we moved the, the comparison, the branch resolution to the instruction decode stage, now that we're reading register one and register four in the instruction decode stage, we can no longer forward. Right, because we and so now we have a data hazard because register one for the load instruction is not available until the end of the memory stage, so we can't forward it to the decode stage to do the comparison here. Similarly, register four is not available until the end of the execute stage, so we can't forward it to the instruction decode stage of the branch to do the comparison. So in these two cases, right, in the case where we have an uh, 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 an add instruction right before the branch that produces a value the branch needs or a load instruction 
two instructions before the branch that uh, produce the value of the branch needs. In this case, we need to stall. And the way we stall is by uh, stalling the branch. So when we have the branch in the instruction decode stage, rather than letting it continue, uh, we uh, insert, an, uh, insert a bubble and we repeat the instruction decode stage. And now that we repeat the instruction decode stage, now registers one and registers four are available and can be forwarded to the instruction decode. Okay. Is this clear to everyone? Any questions about this? Uh, sir, why we didn't do it like uh, before when we do bubbles for the whole line? Here we did just for the three three instructions. Uh, oh, so so before when I was putting bubbles uh, for the whole row, uh, we we hadn't explained to you yet how the pipeline works. So that was kind of just to simplify things. Okay, so so putting bubbles everywhere here is because we don't have bubble in the instruction fetch. Okay, we actually did have an instruction that was fetched, uh, but then we re we replaced that with a bubble and we repeated the instruction D. Uh -huh. So we actually repeat it and then uh, continue the... Instruction. Right, exactly. So this so this diagram here is more accurate. Okay. Diagram where we put five bubbles everywhere, that was that was not exactly what happens. Uh, but But, you know, we didn't want to complicate everything at the same time uh, la last time, so that's why we just put bubbles everywhere just for simplification. Okay, so someone is asking, what if the load was immediately before the branch? And that's a great question, and you're absolutely right. In this case, for two cycles, and that's actually the topic of my next slide. So if we have a load instruction that's immediately before the branch, so the, lo the result of the load instruction is not available the end of the memory stage. However, we need that value in the instruction decode stage. So we need it two stages earlier as opposed to one stage earlier. Okay, so in this case, we have an even, even bigger problem. In this case, we, need, we cannot forward two cycles back. What we need to do is we need to wait until the instruction decode stage coincides with the right back stage of the load. So in this case, when you're going to need to stall, we have a data hazard and we need to stall two cycles. Okay, so we stall the instruction decode stage and then we stall it again until we have the result of the load and we can forward it to the decode stage of the branch. Okay, so if we have a load branch data hazard, then we need to stall twice. Okay, so as you can see, Moving the branch, moving the branch resolution to the instruction decode stage has advantages and disadvantages. The advantage is that we stall less on a misprediction. We lose fewer cycles if we mispredict the branch. But the disadvantage is that uh, if we have a look, if you have, if the branch is using a value that was recently computed, we might have it. It, it increases uh, the 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 situation of having it, the, the the possibility of having a data hazard on the branch. Okay, any questions? Is everything clear to everyone? All right, great. So if everything is clear, then we have reached the end of chapter four. We have reached the end of the sub part of part three on processor design. And what we have in the course is uh, chapter five, which is about the memory, or, uh, sorry, we were done with process organization. What we have left is the memory organization. Okay, uh, so we're done talking with about process organization. We're almost at the end of the course. We still have memory organization left, which is also a very exciting topic. So I hope you liked uh, this uh, chapter on processor organization. Uh, we talked a lot about a lot about a lot of important topics: building a data path, pipelining it, uh, data hazards, and forwarding, and, and also stalling and control hazards. Uh, and we also talked about structure hazards. Uh, so if you want to read more, we 
about today, you can refer to sections 4.7 and 4.8 in the textbook. And if there are no questions, uh, and uh, there are no more questions, then that is all for today. And I will see you next time. Bye, everyone.